words have kind of the same kind of direction. You know, it, it, it's a, of, to me it's of death. And, um, and he was just, he was in this darkness. He was, you know, a real, a real darkness that he didn't know any other way out of. So. Well, he used to come down here a lot. I started coming down here was because he would help me sneak out of the house with him. And we'd go meet our friends. And there used to be a bridge right there. And we'd just come out here and sit on the bridge. And there's a train that goes up above so we could tell what time it was. Because it used to run around there around 1 o'clock or so. And it was just nice. He was talking about bumps in the road. And he stated that because he was a, a convoy driver, he was told not to stop for anything because it would put him and whoever was in his convoy in danger, and that meant even children. So if a child was in front, he was supposed to just keep going. Um, and he had stated to me that when he asked his higher up, how do I deal with that? He was told, just don't look back. And then that was it. Um, he also talked about shooting two, two uh, soldiers, two Iraqi soldiers at close range. And he would make these statements and then he would just stop and it would be silent. Because wh what am I supposed to respond? I, I have no idea. And I think a lot of people are going to be in that situation, uh, that are in that situation and have been for all the wars. When you have your loved ones coming home and they're trying their best to explain to you the trouble that they're going through and the torture and it's got to be so frustrating that we can't understand. At least I know I couldn't. And from what we were told, if from what he said to you, he did never told me. Um, but what he said to his sister and his his dad was that he was ordered ordered to shoot. And he said that he had closed his eyes because somebody who I'm assuming is a higher up came up behind him and said, "Pull the fucking trigger, Lucy." And he said he closed his eyes and he just shot. And that's that's how he, he did that. Yes, he has two dog tags. Um, from what he said, that these are dog tags of two Iraqi soldiers that he feels personally responsible for their deaths. And um, they were, uh, how do you say, Jeffrey wore these around his neck to honor these men. It wasn't a trophy, you know. It wasn't. It was. It was to honor them. That's why he, you know, he carried this with him. And I think it was to remind himself every day, which is why Julie, his girlfriend, I think, was trying to get these off of him. It, want, it reminded him every day of what he did. He was just too far, too far gone that day, and. Um, at one point he was sitting at the kitchen table and he was talking to a staff from the VA hospital on the phone and I was looking at him and all of a sudden he just reached out and gave the phone to me and he then he took it back and said here talk to my little sister she graduated today and gave me the phone and so I took the phone and I went outside and talked to this to this gentleman who was on the phone and told him that uh, this is on June 5th and I said if you don't help my brother he's not going to be here at this time next month. That was June 5th that I told him that, and on July 5th he wasn't. And I it was on the steps and I told him that Jeff told me about the rope and the tree he had picked out and that we needed help. And they told me, just get him here. Just, just get him here. So at that point, I went back inside and everybody was trying to talk Jeff into going. And when we got to the VA, Jeff talked to the gentleman, and at one point, and it, I guess it's the thing that just shocked me, and I know it wasn't this particular person, but the way the system is set up, but the staff asked him if he got rid of the rope yet, and my brother's response to that was, shut up, shut up, shut up. He just put his hand up towards the guy's face and looked down, and he was just so passive, and it, it was so sad, and that was it. That that was the end of that conversation, and I'm sitting here going, that 
that response is not okay. Um, and we sat out there for a while, and then finally the staff said, Jeff, you can either come in or you can go. And my sister was in tears. She was on the phone with my parents on and off. I was on the phone with my parents. I was almost in hysterics at one point going, we can't take him home like this. And I called and just said, he's, he's coming back. He, he, they're sending him back home with us. My grandfather was so upset. I just, it, it was sad. I, I remember my grandpa talking to people, just pleading with staff there to do something to get his grandson help. You shouldn't have to plead for that. These are our veterans. They fought in a war. You shouldn't have to ask. And the hospitals and stuff shouldn't expect the soldiers to be able to ask because Jeff couldn't. It wasn't that he didn't want it. He wasn't trying to leave. He wasn't mad. He was sitting there talking to everybody. And I don't, he wasn't even quick to leave when they said it. When they told him he had to go, he, he stayed there for a few minutes. And then he sauntered to the car. It wasn't like somebody who was cursing people out and, and even if they do, look at what they've gone through and what they're still going through. 